It is so good to be here today. It's funny how our hearts don't tend to appreciate things until we are without them. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, I'm thinking of this as uh, the first Sunday without our brother, Andrew Separito, who we buried on Friday. And his mom is here, praise God. It's good to see you. And we'll be praying for you. You have a lot of people here that love you. You know that. Well, this morning we're back in the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 17, uh, hopefully the first 21 verses, although I've split it up into two just in case I run long because I (laughs) tend to run long. Forgive me. In fact, why don't you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come to worship you, to declare the words that we know and that we believe, and Lord, for the opportunity to be with our brothers and sisters face to face. I pray that you help us, Lord, as we get into your word, that our hearts might be receptive to what you have to say to each one of us. Your word is marvelously universal because of your Holy Spirit that when we go through a passage, there's a message for each one of us. And I pray that you help us, Lord, to get that which you wish us to receive today. So, Lord, this is for you. I pray that you mold us and make us in your image. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as I said, we're in chapter 17 this week. I've I've selected 20 and 21, if we get that far, as a main verse. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. It's an interesting passage, but, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll get there uh, today. That would be really great. If not, it'll be next week. For the last two weeks, we were in chapter 16, and if you remember, Jesus talking a lot about God and about money, that you can't serve them on an equal plane. You can't serve them together. That has to be that God is more important than your money. And then there was the parable, or, or the, should say the story, not the parable, about Jesus telling about Lazarus and the rich man and how they both died and they went to their place. One was Abraham's bosom, which he would know as paradise, and the other would be Hades as a holding place. And the rich man cried out and wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and come and dip it on his tongue to relieve his torment. Uh, And Jesus taught very solidly that there is a hell and eternal punishment and that there was a separation between the two. So we looked at that and some other passages in the scriptures about that. As we go on and as Jesus is teaching, we're going to move on to chapter 17. Let's start with the first 10 verses, shall we? Verse 1. And then he said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him to have a millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith, for obvious reasons. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having a servant, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper? And gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things in which you are commanded, 
say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Well, that's quite a lot of information. Let's see if we can get through it. Forgiveness, big topic. Seven times a day, somebody says, oh, by the way, I ruined your car on purpose. Forgive me. I won't do it again because your car is totaled. <laughs> Jesus says you forgive them. Seven times in a day. You, go, you got seven cars? <laughs> it begins to get old when somebody says, I'm sorry, I, I repent, which means I won't do it again. I've turned 180 degrees. And they apparently don't mean it because it happens again and again and again and again. And I don't know about you, but the three strikes rule goes for me. At least somewhere in my manufactured human psyche, I have a three strikes rule. You screw up three times, you're done. Reminds me of the Amish couple. They just got married. And they're, they're leaving the chapel and he's with his wife and they're clip, 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 clip. And the, the horse stops and he's whipping the horse and whipping the horse, the horse doesn't go. He goes out of the carriage and goes up to the horse and he looks at him and he goes, that's one. <laughs> he gets back in, clip, 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 clip. And then he goes off the road and he's trying to get him back on the road and he's going off the road and he's getting him back on the road. And he pulls over, and he stops the horse, he gets out, and he points to the horse, he goes, that's two. He goes, and the horse begins to go crazy, and he begins to go wild, and he's going faster, and they're both bouncing in their buggies, and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. He pulls over, shoots the horse in the head. His newlywed looks to him and says, why did you do that? Now we have to walk. That's one. So that, that's the, I didn't plan on saying that, but there it is. I, that's what goes through my mind when I think about forgiveness. I, I have a three strike rule and I'm kind of like that really shallow, you know, Amish guy in the story that I'm, you know, I can put up with so much, but then I'm done. You, 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 you ever, you guys don't have that problem. That's good. Well, let's get into it. Verse 1. He said to his disciples, it's impossible no offense that should come. You guys do know that, right? Stuff's going to happen. People are going to mess you up. People are going to betray you. They're going to talk behind your back. You know you're going to get hurt. It's impossible that offenses will not come. You're going to be offended in this life. If, if you plan on living with yourself or anyone else, it will be exponential. But... Woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. A scandalon is what he's referring to about these offenses. A scandalon is anything that trips somebody else up. It's actually part of a trap that holds the bait that engages the cage or the trap which would mean you being captured or uh, put to death. That's what the scandal on is. It's this crooked stick that's there. And these offenses, you, you might get lured into something and, uh, you know, it may have been something that you saw on your phone and say, oh, I got a great deal. All I have to do is give my credit card number. These things are going to happen. But Jesus says, woe to you if you're the cause of that. Matthew 16, 23 there's another where, where this offense is used. He turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. He uses this word when speaking to Peter, when Satan speaking through Peter is telling Jesus, oh, you don't have to go to the cross, Lord. Never, never, never. We'll make sure of that. I, I got a sword. I'm ready. He said, you're an offense to me. And he was speaking to the devil through him. 
in Romans chapter 14, 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block, that's the same word for offense, or cause to fall in our brother's way. I want to make sure <clears throat> that my life, my behavior, my words don't stumble you. That's, uh, that's a lot of work. Because some of you are very thin-skinned. If I talk in a Staten Islandish way. <laughs> now nah, you people are thick like rhinoceros. <laughs> Romans 16 says, Now I urge you therefore note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine in which you have learned and avoid them. Doesn't say you have to fix everybody. There are people that you just say goodbye to. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So there are people that you should walk away from. You don't necessarily have to have everybody in your life. And as far as it lies within you, you live at peace with all men. But the Bible recognizes that there are some people you will not be able to live at peace with. And there are some people you should not be living in peace with. In 1 John 2.10, I love this. For he loves his brother, he who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. In other words, as long as I have love in my heart for you, that I'm looking out for your best interests first, even above my own, there will be no occasion for me to stumble you because I'm looking out for your interests first. And so as long as I have love as my primary motive for those things, the Spirit of God's going to guide me so that I don't do that. I may step on a landmine or trigger you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it might be that I wore red today. I, you know, I don't know. Some people get triggered easier than others. And yet, when we have love for one another and you're really truly concerned about the good of another, it's not going to happen because there's nothing in you to cause someone to stumble. You're not going to trip anybody up. Well, this is what a millstone is if you don't have one of those at home. Uh, a millstone, whether it's the upper or the lower millstone, it really doesn't matter. They're both extremely heavy, and they're just a giant rock with a hole in the middle um, designed to grind grain. You put grain on it, you put an animal on this particular one and go around, and it would grind it into a fine powder. Here we see the protective, loving heart of our good shepherd. Jesus says, you know, offenses are going to happen, but don't be the one who's going to be the offending party because it will not go well. It's better for you. It's a better thing that you have one of these tied around your neck and you're thrown into the sea. Now, I don't know if you've ever come close to drowning. The Jersey Shore has crazy waves sometimes. I remember as a kid getting tumbled in the surf and, you know, all you hear is... And you don't know which way is up and which way is down. And I can only imagine what that's like. And Jesus said it would be better if that were to happen to you than for you to stumble one of these little ones of mine. He says in another place, Matthew chapter 18, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and they were drowned in the depth of the sea. That is God's protective heart for you. So I want to be careful that I don't mess you up. I want to make sure that I'm teaching you right and I don't offend you unnecessarily, unless I have to. And I can do it, but I don't want to. And this one makes me think, well, you know what, I'm just as big a sinner as anybody else. And so I really have no right to look down my nose or, or be anything towards anybody else. And if I do, forgive me. I might do it seven times today, but forgive me. <laughs> Verse 3, take heed to yourselves. First thing Jesus says, he's speaking to his disciples, by the way. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Yeah, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a member of your church, Pastor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, Jesus says, this is one of those very difficult ones to swallow. If somebody sins against you, if they confess, if they agree with what God says, and they say that they're sorry, sorry, by the way, doesn't mean too much, because everybody in prison is sorry, but they'll probably be repeat offenders. 
But that's usually how people patch things up, you know. Maybe you don't know. Okay. This is what people do. When two people have a disagreement, usually it gets heated and they get emotional and they say things that, interestingly enough, have always been there hide, hide, hiding beneath the surface, you know. You're just like your father. Oh, yeah, well, you're just like your mother. Oh, yeah, well, you're worse, and you know. And you say all these emotional things and these horrible things to each other, and then if you're smart, you just get the heck away from each other. You calm down. The Lord begins to speak to you, and you start feeling bad about the things that you said and did. And then you both walk up to each other like this, and you go, I'm sorry. And the other person says, I'm sorry. And then you pretend like nothing happened. And it will happen again. Because you haven't, you haven't taken the trash out. You haven't dealt with it. You just, you're sorry that you lost your cool, but you're not sorry for what you said because there's truth in what you said. And it's all this undealt stuff that's just hidden, just swept under the rug until all you have in your living room is rug. So Jesus tells us, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. You know what that means? That's a, it just sounds too much like vomit. But it's going up to somebody and saying, you're wrong. You did this thing, and you're wrong. How many of you enjoy conflict? None of you enjoy conflict. <laughs> Jesus said... You should do this. You should seek conflict. With somebody that sinned against you, you go seek conflict. But I don't want to. I'd rather just let it go. Well, you know, it takes great wisdom and discernment to know what to let go of and what you need to talk about. There are some things you just need to let go. Jesus said, if somebody smacks you on one side of the face, give them the other cheek. There are some things you let go. There are other things that we need to talk about. Okay? But you don't need to talk about every single thing, right? Certainly you can hang on a cross and die and say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Can you do that? Please agree with me. Just say, yes, I can do that, Pastor. Oh, I'm all alone up here. Okay. If your brother sins against you, not if your brother sins against somebody else. You know, you could take up a third-person offense. Hey, I saw the way you looked at him. I don't like the way you looked at him. I'm sorry? What did my look say to you as I was looking at him? You know, you can take up a third-person offense, especially when there's a lot of gossip going on. You can take up a third-person offense. Oh, he did what? I can't believe it. You can get into a third person. But see, they haven't sinned against you. They sinned against somebody else, and now you're the strange recipient of this mess. And now what do you do with it? Well, got to keep it a secret. Got to put it in here with all the others and put it under the rug in my living room. <laughs> if someone sins against you, and if he repents, forgive him. By the way, this is not limiting forgiveness to someone who asks for repentance, because you can forgive anybody. What do you do with a parent? who's offended you in some hideous, horrible, terrible way, and they have died. Oh, well, I'm just never going to forgive them. I'm just going to be bitter and angry, and I'm going to shed that on everyone that I ever meet. Everyone that reminds me of that person, I'm just going to... No, it's not limiting forgiveness. It's setting up a scenario that if somebody comes to you and says, listen, I was wrong, I'm never going to do that again, that you forgive them. And it's about the quantity of how often it happens, because I don't know about you, but... After the second time, I'd be a little like, that's two. <laughs> but love doesn't keep count of a wrong suffered. Being a Christian is very difficult. Because I don't know about you, but I, I just want to take a baseball bat and straighten people out. I want to fix everyone. How about you? And some people need it. <laughs> Except I'm not the one to do it. The Lord is. And that's why it takes great faith. Matthew 18 Great, great chapter on confrontation and how to resolve issues. If your brother sins against you, go. And tell him his fault between you and him alone. You and him alone. So the first person to hear about an offense or a sin against you is the person who sinned against you. Not me. Not anybody else. If the person sins against you, you go to them. Notice I have the word go and highlighted. There's four steps here. There's go. 
There's take, there's let it be. Uh, tell and let it be. So moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone, privately. Don't put it on YouTube. Don't want to see it Twitter. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Hooray! That's, that's one of two choices, isn't it? But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. So what you do is you do an intervention. Hey, you're not going to listen. I'm going to get some people and no, we're not ganging up on you, but we're going to let you know this is what's going on and there's some other people that are now involved. That adds pressure, doesn't it? By the way, there are several of you I'd like to talk to after today's service. <laughs> and Carl, I want you to be there. And Dino, I want you to be there because you're like the biggest guys around. So <laughs> that adds pressure, doesn't it? Anytime you go in the office, there's pressure. I can tell. Everything be established. Verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Uh-oh. So I have some announcements. <laughs> this is God's word. This is, these are the words of Jesus. They're not in red, but they are. Tell it to the church. I believe he means the authoritative governing body of the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Uh, if you don't know what a heathen and a tax collector is, it's somebody who's your enemy, basically. Somebody who's against you. How do you treat somebody that's against you? The Bible says you love them. They don't have fellowship with you. are not going to sit down and have a meal together. We're not going to go into business together. We're not going to be having fellowship together. I'll, I'll show you the same love and concern I would show any other unsaved person and tell you about Jesus Christ, that you need him as your savior, and you need to change. And only God can make a change in us. So I'm not going to treat you harshly or give you, you know, the eyebrow or any of that. You still show them love. And then Jesus says this, Assuredly, whatever you bind on earth would be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth would be loosed in heaven. Well, that's a great verse to say, whatever I decide is right. But what it means is, if you've gone through this process of trying to forgive and trying to administer repentance, if you've done your best to reconcile, God knows. And the things that are already going on in heaven, you guys have verified and said, this is what is. There are people that you hold things against and you say, you need to repent, you need to get over this. And people say, uh-uh, I won't do it and you can't make me. Well, I can't make you, but I can do all of this. <coughs> and God sees and God knows and he's undertaking on our behalf as well. Again, I say to you that two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. You guys ever heard that, like at a prayer meeting or something? Well, this is always about reconciling parties that are opposed. Isn't that interesting? In the, it's right there in the context of resolving issues. That you pray, and there are two or more. By the way, those are the two or more that were brought in on the deal. For where there are two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And what is he doing in the midst of them? Trying to bring resolution, trying to bring humility, trying to bring repentance. So all of those passages have to be read in context. Because when you take the text away from the context, all you have left is the con. <coughs> Somebody trying to sell you something. So that's what the scripture teaches. Don't confront someone if you owe that person an apology first. Sound like a good rule? I'm going to go to them. They're, oh, I can't believe what they did. Oh, yeah? Well, did you have any part in it? Well, yeah, a small amount, like 1%. Well, you think you might want to correct your own attitude and get your own act together before you go and talk to them, before you make a bigger mess? <laughs> Pastor, I can't believe that. <laughs> Don't confront somebody if they're due an apology. You got to clean up your own act. You got to take the log out of your own eye before you go strain it at a speck in somebody else's eye, right? Just not. Just please. Okay, I'm all alone today. Rebuke in private and praise in public. These are little things I've learned along the way. If you're going to praise somebody, if you're going to say something good about somebody, do it in public. Right? 
If you're going to rebuke them for something they did wrong, don't do it in public. Don't do it in front of another living soul until you get through the process. Do it in private. Best possibility that they're going to have the catcher's mitt on and they're going to catch what you're throwing. If you have somebody else there, you change the whole dynamic, right? In private, you reprove somebody. If you have something against them, you go to them. Nobody likes confrontation. I didn't see one hand up here today, but we should do it. Rebuke in private, praise in public. Because what we tend to do is we put the cork in the bottle. Some of you may be a volcano type person who just takes everything and stuffs it. How many of you are stuffers? Oh, good. Okay. You just, something happens and you just go, I can't believe they did that again. I can't believe <laughs> Hold it in. Hold. Hold. Don't say a word, just smile. You see, this whole process pulls the cork. And it gets it out. And now you can deal with it. And there can be reconciliation, there can be forgiveness, or there can be distance. That's justified at this point. But not when you're carrying it around and you know you, you got the you got the bubbles coming up saying, I gotta let the cork go. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. There shouldn't be a cork. There shouldn't be a bottle. Make sense? Saving you a lot of therapy here, reading the scriptures. People who forgive can and should also be people who come front. What is not confessed cannot be forgiven. You realize if you're holding something against somebody and you're angry with them, they may not have a clue. And they don't even have the opportunity to apologize and, and repent. So you're shortchanging them by not confronting them. By the way, this, these couple of uh, things are from uh, Henry Cloud, who's a, a doctor, and he wrote a book called Boundaries, which is a very healthy book to read. So people who can... who Forgive can and should be people who confront. It's the only way to peace, guys, is, is to uncork the bottle and deal with it. What is not confessed cannot be forgiven. So if you, if you don't speak about it and you just bottle it up, you're, in, you're enduring the pain for yourself and maybe the other person scot-free, right? right? This is stuff we all deal with. Forgiveness does not make the other person right. It makes you free. Forgiveness does not make the other person right. It makes you free. Does that make sense? Because, boy, you can carry around that bitterness. You can carry around things that you were never designed to carry around, and Jesus isn't going to help you with them because he already told you what to do with it. you got to deal with it. Pop the cork, pour it out, and let's, let's have a conversation. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, after that section of Matthew 18, says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often... Shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Well, apparently Peter heard the previous sermon. <laughs> now the funny thing is, Peter is saying this to him in full view of his brother Andrew, who's probably who he's referring to. Because if you have a brother named Andrew, you know what I'm talking about. Up to seven times, and Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. In other words, there's no counting. There's no, that's one. There's none of that. You are perpetually, continually forgiving. Make sense? That's a very difficult way to live. And yet Jesus is teaching us how we should live. Now we have some really great examples of unforgiveness and some good examples of forgiveness. In Matthew 18, 29, Matthew 18, one of my favorite passages about all of this, Jesus tells a parable of a king, and he had a, a servant who owed him 10,000 talents. He calls him in, he says, you know, what's going on? How are you going to pay me back? 10,000 talents, by the way, is 10,000 years wages. Now, I don't know how many years you're going to get in in your life, but I can't pay somebody 10,000 years worth of wages. I don't have it. Makes you wonder what in the world did he do with it? Why in the world would you lend somebody that much without some kind of security? But the king calls him in and says 10,000 talents and he goes, please be patient with me. I will repay you every penny, which is a lie because there's no paying it back. It's like an incredible debt you can't pay. 
And the king has compassion on him and forgives him of the debt and lets him go. Incredible act of mercy. And yet he goes out and finds a fellow servant that owes him a couple dollars for a, a Starbucks. And he grabs him by the throat and he chokes him and he says, pay me what you owe me. And the guy with the same exact word says, I will repay you, please be patient. And he says, no. And he gets him turned over to the police and the police throw him in jail. The king's servants apparently observed all this and went back and told the king, hey king, that guy you forgave just choked the guy for a latte. The king calls him back in It says, I forgave you of that whole big debt that you came in here and I had compassion on you. Shouldn't you have had compassion on this guy who bought you a coffee? That's it. I'm going to sell everything you have and I'm going to extract my debt. We didn't sign papers yet. Done deal. We're going to sell your wife, your children. We're going to sell everything that you have to repay the debt. And we're going to put you in prison and I'm going to hand you over to the torturers. Jesus means that until you can pay the entire debt. Do you know how much you get when you get paid at the end of the week of torture? Zero. This is a picture of hell. Jesus is saying, if you're not going to be forgiving, then maybe you don't know what it is to be forgiven. If you did, you wouldn't choke somebody. And certainly God has forgiven each one of us of a giant stack of stuff. Stuff in your heart and your mind that only you and him know and he forgives you and he loves you anyway. What right do you have to go up and choke somebody that owes you some little infraction? You don't. Another example of forgiveness is the woman that was thrown at Jesus' feet in John 8. They take this woman and they were trying to trap Jesus and they threw her down in some various stage of undress undoubtedly and say, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? It's one of those things where you can't answer right. If he says, well, don't stone her, then he's going against Moses and the law. And what kind of a good Jewish rabbi would he be? And if he says stoner, then he's the guy who just authorized her death right there. And you weren't allowed to do that. The Romans would have you strung up for that. So Jesus was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So he bends down and he begins to write in the ground with his finger. Until everything kind of died down. And then Jesus stood up and he says, you who are without sin cast the first stone. And it says, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, they all dropped their rocks and they walked away. The oldest presumably having a longer list of sins or maybe being wiser and more aware of them. Until Jesus got up and there was no one around except for the woman. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? And she goes, there are none. And he says, well, then neither do I accuse you get this, go and sin no more. That's the mercy of God, isn't it? Amen. Go and sin no more, which is the whole point of confrontation. And of course, we have the best example in Jesus when on the cross, one of the seven things he says at the cross is, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Jesus hanging on a cross, asking for forgiveness for the ones who are still looking at him with angry eyes, the Pharisees who are gloating, those who are saying, yeah, look, you healed others. Why don't you come down off the cross if you're the son of God? And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's the ultimate act of forgiveness that Jesus did for us. How can we not be forgiving? Verse 5, <clears throat> And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> yeah, because, oh my goodness, I can't do this. I can't forgive seven times a, a, a day. Somebody's going to do something intentionally harmful and sin against me in some way, shape, or form. I mean, not, you know, not burping in your presence or something silly, but sinning against you. Intentional harm. And they say, 
I repent. I won't do it again. And it continues to happen. How long would you hold out? So the disciples say, Lord, increase our faith. We can't do this. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Notice he doesn't say as small as a mustard seed. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So what is this faith of a mustard seed? I always thought it had to do with the size because a mustard seed is a small seed. But here he says faith as a mustard seed. You know what a mustard seed is? It's a miracle. It's this teeny little seed that you put into the dirt and it has no life in it at all. It's completely dry. It's completely dead. There is nothing that you would think that anything could happen. It's a dry seed, something you might chew up and throw down your throat, you know, like in one chew. But it it possesses life. It possesses all of the material to create a tree. It gets put in the dirt. It knows which way is up. It knows it needs light. How does it know? There's a crater. Moisture activates it. There's a hole that pops on it, and this little green thing comes up, knows which way to go. One day pops up, and there's this little green. And now the solar panel's open, and it's collecting energy, and now it's going to grow even faster and longer, and the roots have grown, and now it's absorbing moisture from the soil along with minerals and everything, and it creates this incredible tree. Wow. What kind of faith does a mustard seed have? It is completely obedient. It is completely obedient to do what it's told to do. It doesn't vary from that. It doesn't argue. It doesn't say, no, it's cold out there. It doesn't do any of that. Jesus' point is, if you want to forgive, it doesn't have to do with the size of your faith. It's whether you have faith at all. Because that is what is going to be the power that enables you to forgive. And it's not faith in another person, by the way. Because when you forgive them, they'll probably hurt you again. In fact, Jesus said offenses are going to come. Ta-da! Good news. People are going to offend you. But, where's your faith? My faith is in God. You mean when I forgive my wife for losing her keys again? That takes faith? Yeah, it takes faith. I have to believe that God's in on it and God's going to help her to not lose her keys. Yeah, it takes great faith, but it takes faith, period. Because that's not in and of yourself, is it? It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. Faith is a gift from God. So, faith. Yeah, Lord, increase our faith. I would definitely do that. Because, you know, if I'm going to... Yeah, I mean, Mighty Mouse had some definite confidence, right? And that's... You and I have the ability to forgive, and we just don't know it. We're like that mustard seed that has everything that we need if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have everything that we need to be able to forgive, and it doesn't matter the infraction, how big, how long ago, how often, all of that's been addressed. It's not the size of your faith, it's the object of your faith. Because there are a lot of people that have faith. I got faith. What do you got faith in? I got faith in my faith. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I believe that I believe I believe. I believe. I believe. I'm going to be taller. I'm going to grow seven vertebrae. Hallelujah. I believe it, Jesus. I believe. Is your faith in what God has said? Or is your faith in something you've manufactured? That's the difference between having faith in your faith and having faith in what God said. Having faith in what God said means you believe what he says and you put it into action. Because it's true. Just like you put all of your weight in these chairs today. Boom, you dropped in, found your favorite spot, and there you went. And it's got all of your weight. You trust us that we put chairs out here that aren't broken. This faith is in God, that he's going to make things happen. And it's the object of your faith. If God is the object of your faith, you can do everything he's told you to do. If your faith is in another human, you will be hurt. Because offenses will come. It is not the size of your faith, it's the quality of your faith. It's not whether you believe God, but, you know, like the man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Sometimes we can be on both sides of the, the fence, where I believe God, at least I know mentally that I should be believing God, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know if God can handle this, I'm not sure if God's going to do this, and we're kind of in the, in the mire, you know, we're kind of in the, in the weeds. 
It's the quality of your faith. Do you really trust Jesus? My question is, so do you believe God? Do you believe what God said? It says that God so loved the world. By the way, it's not just us in this room. It's the people out there. It's Putin. Biden. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's everybody. Do you believe that? If I believe that, I'm going to tell them because if I believe that there is an eternal punishment for those who reject Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell people about it. How could I not? This is Charles Blondin. He lived in the late 1800s. You may have heard of him. How have you heard of Charles Blondin? The great Blondin, yeah. He was a tightrope walker, one of the first, actually. He was the first to cross over Niagara Falls. And he did this in 1857, if I'm not mistaken. Interesting guy. He did this, and uh, he's from France. His name really isn't Charles Blondin. It's Charles something else, but he had blonde hair, so they called him Blondin. He would cross over, and by the way, this is called the Rainbow Bridge that you see in the background. That's a real photo from 1857. He strung out this two-inch rope from one side to the other, this cable, and he walked on it from one side to the other. Then when he got to the other side, he went back over, and he did a somersault on the wire. He asked, how many of you believe I can make it? And they all said, yay! And so he, did. he went out there with a stove, cooked himself an egg, and then he took the omelet and he lowered it on a rope down to the Maid of the Mist. And they ate the omelet on board, and they said it was a good omelet. He went out to the middle, and he lowered a rope down to the Maid of the Mist, and they gave him a bottle of wine. And he pulled it up, and he poured himself a glass, and he drank it in the middle of the, right in the, middle of the wire. He's doing all these incredible things. He went out there with a desk and a chair, and he balanced the chair on one leg on the rope, with a table, and he sat there with a glass and he drank. And there's a picture of him. He did all these things. He even did it blindfolded. He once did it with baskets around his legs. He did it with a, with a bag over his head. He did this over a long period of time and he was selling tickets at 25 cents a piece, which when then was probably a bunch of money. And the people, there were about 25,000 people that gathered on this one day to come and see him. And so he goes over and he says, how many of you believe that I can go to the other side with a person on my back? And they all said, yay! And he goes, I'd like a volunteer. <laughs> and no one volunteered except his manager. His manager was about 140 pounds. He was 140 pounds. His manager goes up on his back, and there's a picture of it here on the far left. And he walks over the wire, except they didn't have these supporting wires all the way down in the middle, which stops the, the rope from swaying in the wind. And he got about a third of the way out there, and he began sweating, and he was fatigued. And he told his manager, listen, you've got to get down. I've got to rest. <laughs> his manager was not a tightrope walker. His manager was a manager making money. He gets down and stands on the rope and he has to hold and now the wind is blowing. And then when it was time, he says, okay, I'm, I'm recovered, let's go. And he goes to climb on top of him. He has these very slick silk pants on. So he's trying to get back on his back and he's getting no traction. He can't get up and now they're wobbling and wiggling and they get about two-thirds of the way over and they do this several times. One of the supports actually breaks holding the rope and they teeter almost falling off the rope until he gets to the other side. This really happened. You can look it up. Wikipedia is full of information. June 30, 1859, he actually did this. He's done a headstand. There, there he is with his desk and his chair and his glass of wine. That is what real faith looks like. It's what his manager did. Real faith is what his manager did. The crowd has said, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Nobody, nobody would volunteer. Real faith, you put your full weight, you put your full trust in, 
the one who's on the wire. And for us, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what faith in Jesus Christ is. It's not a mental ascent that, yeah, he was a historical figure. I know everything he did. It means I trust him in every way. All the songs we sang this morning were not my pick. They were Rocco's. And guess what? They all spoke of that. Just so happens. And so he talks about a mustard seed that you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea. Well, what's that all about? Do you understand what the mulberry tree represents? It's a tree that has really deep roots. I, there was a mulberry tree in, in a yard that I once rented in South River, and I had to cut it down because it was the only parking place for our cars, and the berries would drop, and the birds would eat the berries, and they would drop. <laughs> So, you know, you, instead of covering your car or washing it every half a day, I'm cutting the tree down. So I took the tree down, but it kept, continued to grow back. It was one of those things that had a really good root system. So mulberry trees, he says, you could tell this mulberry tree to be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea. It was known for its root system. What is Jesus trying to say? It doesn't matter how deep the unforgiveness and the bitterness is in your heart. You can speak to it and God will tear it out and throw it in the sea. This is all in context of forgiving and reconciling. You see that? It's not landscaping. Jesus isn't saying, yeah, you don't like that bush? Pull it out and just speak it and it'll be thrown in the ocean. Why in the ocean? Because that's also a euphemism of where he throws our sin. He throws our sin into the sea and he remembers them no more. So you see, the mulberry tree represents something that's grown inside of you, a, a root of bitterness that's gone down deep. It doesn't matter how deep it is. Jesus says if you speak to it and if you believe in faith, you can get rid of that. And it's not about claiming a Cadillac or a, a Range Rover or whatever. Mark 11, 23 to 26, Jesus says this, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be, me removed, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Well, that sounds like a blanket statement to just say, I can pray for whatever I want and it's going to come. And some people accept it as that. But it's in the context of forgiveness in our own hearts. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, there it is. Forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. That sounds very conditional. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I like to put it this way. If you can't forgive somebody else, how is it that you've been forgiven? How could it be? If God, if I really believe that God forgave me of all my sins and he put it upon his own son and his own son had to die in my place so that by faith I trust in Christ and I have eternity and I have a new life and a new heart and a new mind and God guides me, is that true? Do I really believe that? Well, then why can't I do that for another person? If you've got an empty cup, there's no way you're going to be able to pour it into somebody else's. But if your cup is full... If you've been forgiven and you have the grace of God, you should be able to pour out. And, uh, what do you need? Forget, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. It should be just that easy. Amen. Make sense? He also talks about a mountain in another passage. The disciples came to Jesus privately. This is Matthew 17. He says, why could we not cast it out? This was a demon that they tried to cast out while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, there it is, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The mulberry tree represents something where you have a root of bitterness, something that's down deep. The mountain represents something that's just impossible. <laughs> I need to get to the other side, but there's a mountain in the way. What are the chances you're going to make it? Oh, pretty much zero. It's an immovable object that stands between you and your goal. That's what that mountain is. And Jesus said, you can pray it away. If it's a demonic force, if it's something between you and what God wants you to do, you can speak to that and it'll be gone. It's not about silly stuff. I pray God gives me a 50,000 square foot home. I, I believe it, so I'm going to receive it. Well, it has everything to do with what's going on inside of your heart, which you have control of. 
Understand? Yes. Okay. And Jesus gives us a little parable. Which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once, sit down and eat? By the way, that's not the way things are done. The master of the house is the one who eats. It's the servant who's supposed to serve the master of the house. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and then afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I think not. You see, it's the idea of somebody who's a servant, somebody that's a slave, somebody that owes you cash, and they're paying you off. Are you going to say thank you, or are you going to offer to them, hey, why don't you sit down and eat? You know, you, you've been working hard. Um, you know, kick back. You know, put your feet up. Relax. Uh, which of you employers would tell that to your employees? Your employee comes in late, and you go, hey, man, looks like you've had a hard day. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, boss. Sorry, come on over here. Why don't you, i got a pork roll and cheese here for you. Why don't you put your feet up on the desk? You know, maybe take a little nap. You say, which employer is going to do that? No, he's going to say, listen, I'm paying you good money. You need to get, you're on the clock, boss. Come on, let's, let's get it done. That's my pork roll, egg, and cheese. While you're at it, bring me a cup of coffee. You see, there's a priority here. There's an order here. Why does Jesus insert this into the middle of forgiveness and reconciliation? Why does he say this along with a mustard seed and mulberry roots and mountains? Because we have an obligation to obey, to do the things that God has asked us to do. Because he's the boss. I can, I can stand and cry about my situation all day long. God, you don't understand. It's so hard living with this woman. Or maybe she's thinking the same thing. It's, so hard living with this man. He stands up there and talks about me every Sunday. <laughs> and yet, the Lord tells us to serve him, doesn't he? We get it backwards sometimes, and I know most of Christianity gets it backwards. They, we think God is our servant. He's our genie in the bottle. We get three wishes. I know, I read the story. And that's not true. We are his creation. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. We are his servants. It's like, Lord, what do you want me to do? What would you have me do here, Lord? That should be the thing on our mind and our lips all the time. Not, I need, I want, hurry up, I'm waiting. And that makes me the center of the universe. I am just a guy who plows. I'm just a guy who shepherds sheep. You don't want to see your employee doing this. Life is not about you. Surprisingly, it's about him. And we're here for his benefit. He's not there for ours. In Matthew 6, and 34, Jesus says, but seek first, in other words, of first importance on your list, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. Today's got enough trouble you've you got to go through. Don't worry about tomorrow's paperwork in the, in the inbox. Take care of what's in front of you on the desk. Make sense? Okay. Last verse. Thank God. So, likewise, you... When you have done all these things which you are commanded, by the way, which is forgiving over and over and over perpetually somebody, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty. It's not just a duty, though. It's a real pleasure. Because in forgiving someone else, we're being obedient to the Lord. And I can just see the Lord looking down and going, good job. And that's who we live for. We don't, live, we don't forgive other people because we think they'll change. I'll forgive you this time. There's one. You know, we don't do that. We forgive because God's forgiven us and we have tons of it. We can pour it out in everybody. You remember Joshua chapter 5, this wonderful story of how Joshua had just come over the, the Jordan. He's entering into this promised land. Everybody got circumcised. 
because apparently they didn't get that done in the desert. And it was this new thing. They were all kind of healing up. And just before they went out, he sees this man. He describes him as a man who's standing there in battle gear with his sword drawn. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but if somebody walks up to you and has a sword drawn, you want to know who in the heck this is. And it came to pass when Joshua was by the Jericho that he lifted his eyes and he looked and behold a man who stood opposite to him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no. Okay. A or B? I'm picking D. No. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he worshipped, and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? You see, instantly he recognized who this was. This is Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, the general of God's armies. What does my Lord say to his servant? Immediately he knew his place. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot and place it where you stand. The place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Do you remember the last time this was done? His predecessor, which was Moses. Take your shoes. Why? Because it's the very presence of God. Joshua knew his place. On the ground, on my knees, face to the ground. By the way, when you do that to angels, they say, hey, cut it out. No, no, get up, get up. I'm just a servant just like you. But this one receives worship. Jesus received worship. Jesus is God because only God gets worshiped. Amen. Just thought I'd throw that in. It's free of charge. <laughs> we're going to stop right there on verse 10 because we're not going to make it to 21. You guys will be all worn out and half of you will sleep. So, <laughs> <clears throat> the scripture is so rich and there's so many layers and so many things. How many of you got something out of today? God speak to your heart? Yes. Right this minute, I want to consecrate this to the Lord. Let's pray as the worship team comes up. Father, you know the trees that try to take root in our heart. You know the mountains that stand before us. You know all these things. Lord, I believe you have allowed them to be there so that we can see your power and your strength as we're obedient to have the faith of a mustard seed to do what you've called us to do. Lord, you know each heart here. You know the struggles that we ourselves go through. And, and your word says that every heart knows its own sorrow and none can enter into it except for you, Lord. I pray that you help us to consecrate this moment, this time, when I know that your spirit has spoken to so many. I pray that you help us to talk like you, to walk like you, we might be like you in every way. Help us, Lord, to put down our petty grievances. Help us, Lord, to use the faith that you've given to us. Help us to be led by your spirit so we can do those things that please you. Lord, if there are those who don't know you within the hearing of my voice, I pray that you might use these words to bring them to you. Lord, help us to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.